Um, hi everyone. Again, my name is Destiny Wylianti. I'm a senior at Smith College where I double major in government and Africana studies. Um, thank you to the Five College Digital Humanities um, Initiative. Um, and again, Eric and Evan for the opportunity to embark on this project. Um, so again, the title of my project is Loose and Formal Connections, Black Women Prisoners and the Black International. Um, so this project began um, as a transnational history project to recover the linkages between the lives of two women, uh, two incarcerated women, um, Erica Huggins and Teresa Ramashamola. Um, although they are separated temporally, geographically, and spatially, I wanted to link them in order to say something about the expansiveness of the Black International. The Black International is defined by Michael O. West and William G. Martin as the universal emancipation unbounded by national, imperial, continental, or oceanic boundaries. Therefore, I wanted to make the case that in linking them, a claim could be made about feminist solidarities across geographic lines. However, um, as I embarked on this project uh, and attempted to link the lives of these two women, um, it illuminated, however, the disparities between how women of the so-called third world um, are remembered in history. And looking at them together, Teresa and um, Erica reveals a politics of the archive at play, specifically why women like Teresa Ramashamola's stories are not as present within the archive. So I arrived at the question, what can be learned from juxtaposing the lives of Erica Huggins and Teresa Ramashamola? Huggins and Ramashamola lived parallel lives. In 1969, Erica Huggins, member of the Black Panther Party, faced charges for the murder of Black Panther Party member Alex Rackley. In 1985, um, Teresa Ramashamola uh, faced charges in a group known as the Sharpeville Six for the alleged murder of a Sharpeville deputy, deputy mayor. They were both Black women activists who were mothers at the time of their imprisonment. They were accused from, of murder along with a group of men, which in turn influenced the narratives that emerged about them. However, in effect, they are remembered differently in the history of Black women's studies. There's particular attention paid to Huggins' prison poetry and its themes about freedom and revolution. Um, and in effect, by um, Huggins being able, by her, by Huggins' uh, poetry being within the archive, she can affect have the ability to shape her own story. However, because of the lack of archival material reflecting Rama Shamola's time in prison, her story goes untold. So my project asks the question, how does Teresa, excuse me, how does Rama Shamola's story recover the voices of women of a so-called third world within the Black International? What does her story illuminate about the multitude of actions by nameless everyday women who make up the multitude of Black liberation movements? Um, these questions are particularly important for the field of Black women's studies because this discipline has a particular creed um, of reading against the grain and recovering the histories of Black women like Rama Shamola. Um, because the histories of marginalized people are typically obscured within the archive, scholars and historians of Black women's studies um, actively work against this. Um, Ashley Farmer calls this the power and the production of history. Um, however, still, we do not know about Rama Shamola's story. Therefore, this project takes, seeks to think about the historical presence of Huggins and Rama Shola together to think about differences and how they're remembered within the historical archive. And from these um, observations, a few insights emerge. Uh, dominant narratives of Black women activists, the lack of representation of women of the third world, and implications for the Black international. And um, a key part of this project is the juxtaposition between these two women. Um, although histories of Black women are still scarce, scarce within the archive, when we look at Huggins and Rama Shamola together, we see just how absent Rama Shamola is. Um, and part of that, the digital aspect of this project is being able to map the locations of these women's lives using ArcGIS um, story maps and contrasting that with the media coverage of them and, uh, and observing how they appear within the archive. So the main claims that I make in my project are um, what uh, that dominant narratives of black women activists produce narratives such as the so-called revolutionary and the ordinary woman. Uh, the black, therefore, when we think about the black international and black women's agency, agency, we must be aware 
that often when we are accounting for movements of liberation, we don't think about everyday women like um, Rema Shamola. The third point is that race, gender, and geography influence who narratives surface within the archive. Therefore, when we're looking for evidence of the Black International, specifically whose women, what um, protests and movements had impact, we don't account, again, for the stories that aren't there. And for the sake of this project, I use the term third world to locate um, Rema Shamola's uh, narrative within what Ashley Carmen Farmer calls the third world Black woman. Um, and this frame of activism uh, has an anti-imperialist, internationalist approach, which uh, imagines Black womanhood with race, class, gender, um, and liberation in mind. Dominant stereotypes of Black women activists. So in my um, project, I observed that two main narratives emerge within the Black internationalist tradition, which produce narratives such as the revolutionary woman and the ordinary woman. So um, beginning with uh, Erica Huggins, due to her involvement in the New Haven chapter of the Black Panther Party, she, along with eight others, were persecuted, arrested, and imprisoned for six months uh, after her daughter May was born. While in prison in Connecticut from 1969 to 1972, Erica Huggins wrote about various freedom. Um, many of the women recognized within the Black International are considered to be revolutionaries. Names that come to mind are uh, Angela Davis, Winnie Mandela, Asada Shakur, Erica Huggins, the list goes on. These dichotomies emerge within the Black internationalist tradition, which produce narratives such as the, the revolutionary and the ordinary Black woman. Scholar Joy James argues that women like this were uh, revolutionary because they became one of the few Black female figures in the, um, in the international landscape that were recognized as leaders of an organization that publicly advocated against racist violence. Um, the, the act of becoming a revolutionary points that Black women are made revolutionaries in history and the ways that we remember them um, primarily through the archive. Um, and this in turn is reflected in the archive's orientation toward uh, chronicling the lives of women who are remarkable or individual in some way. As a result, the archive privileges the narratives of women who are revolutionary in this way, and in doing so, reduce the significance of ordinary, everyday women, such as Teresa Ramachamala. And um, the, the relative um, copious amount of evidence of women like um, Huggins supports that claim. Um, there's uh, writings where Erica talks about um, uh, yearning for freedom and the desire for freedom and uh, stu students of the revolution cannot arrest the revolution. A key part here is to make um, note that, again, Black women's histories are already quite marginalized within the archive, but the particular point of this project and a reflection on Black women's studies and uh, Black international studies more broadly is the, the particular space that women of the third world occupy um, and the lack of their narratives and stories within the archive. Teresa Ramachamola, an ordinary woman. So just a little bit of background on Teresa's case. Uh, on um, September 3rd, 1984, uh, Ramachamola was caught in a wave of political unrest due to the increased rents that swept an area known as the Vile Triangle. That moment initiated a level of unrest that had not been seen in South Africa since Soweto exploded in 1976. Uh, later, she, along with five other men, were charged with murder at Pretoria High Court in 1984. Um, in the state of South Africa's legal system in the 1980s, the rule of law played a repressive role in South Africa and Black people were largely removed from its protection. Um, uh, in 1980, South Africa, white minority rule was not simply rule that happened to be co composed of right, white people, but rather ruled by in, in the interests of whites. These interests had a vested interest in the control of black labor, land, the dispossession of forced labor, and the enforcement of white courts by private terror. For the law, it effectively involved the loss of effective independence and for the accused, the denial of justice. 
the really interesting thing about Teresa's story um, is much of the narrative that surrounds her reduces her to, an unlikely, to a quote, unlikely martyr in the struggle against apartheid. However, in my, um, in my uh, project, I hope to, to illuminate that this quote, ordinary quality of Teresa um, actually does not diminish her impact as a political actor. So um, historian Pamela Brooks argues that or, quote, ordinary disenfranchised and seemingly powerless women um, can su successfully confront powerful states and in the process transform their societies. The key word here is ordinary, which in some ways they were not. For the most part, they were not well schooled, they did not belong to the social elite, and they often possessed few economic resources. Yet these women had plenty to say about the source and meaning of many of the, of the injustices under which they lived. They communicated their acute dissatisfaction to similarly situated women and men in their communities, persuading them by example by, to put everything on the line for freedom. Uh, Teresa and women like her in South Africa during the period of apartheid um, uh, did not um, participate in um, uh, liberation movements haphazardly. Um, quote, there's quotes of Teresa's family saying that she always had difficulty accepting authority of any time, and before her not, um, her arrest, she was an, a natural archive, anarchi anarchist. She did not need any theory to tell her that the system of apartheid was wrong. And yet, during um, in, uh, Teresa's imprisonment, uh, many around her attempted to depoliticize her in efforts to um, uh, in efforts to create the campaign for her clemency. A white Sharpeville priest had, who had regularly had um, uh, contact with, um, with Rama Shamola had, went as far as to say that she was, quote, politically unsophisticated and, quote, politically naive and ordinary. However, um, quotes of her family um, and those around her remark that um, Teresa knew that life could not be lived in compliance that freedom came from opposition, and it was not a passive state granted by an enlightened government, but had always to be asserted. And if there were opposition keeping the for forces of tyranny at bay, those would naturally unfold and crush her capacity for spirited independence. The key part of Teresa's story in relation to Erica's is again, the decisions of women of the third world to involve themselves in black liberation movements were not haphazard, but rather intentional decisions made by to articulate their freedom and their desire for liberation. However, history and largely the archive does not see these women as agents. History is being acted upon them and these women are victims of unfortunate circumstances. This is where the narrative of the quote, ordinary woman emerges from to stifle the consciousness of women of the third world um, that they have maintained with them, themselves in, their stat, in the status of black people globally. Um, Teresa's story in, in turn raises questions about whose uh, voices, whose histories and whose memories are privileged and preserved within the archive. Conclusions. So I wanted to conclude this project with a, a a relatively recent quote from um, Rama Shamola before she passed. So in an interview with the reporter 20 years after her release, Rama Shamola expressed feeling neglected by the African National Congress, um, which is the, the, um, the organization that advocated on her behalf for clemency, because she and her five comrades were left on the fringes of freedom. Her health deteriorated with exacerbation of her high blood pressure and sugar diabetes, which she contributed to uh, conditions of high stress that she experienced while imprisoned. She says, I did not fight for parties, but for a better life. Our lives have worsened, have worsened, nothing has changed for me. I'm still living in poverty and my life has stood still since my release from prison. Teresa's reflection um, uh, nails on the head the stakes for ordinary women's presence both within the, heart, the archive and by extension history and calls us to return back to my main question, which is what can be learned by juxtaposing the lives of uh, Huggins and Rama Shamola. Um, by acknowledging the power imbalances at work within the archive, we gain insight into how those same imbalances are figured within the lives of women like Rama Shamola. We also become aware of the extraordinary quality of the ordinary woman 
Um, and in fact, movements of liberation are made up by nameless everyday women. Um, and when we don't question the copious amount of archival records on um, Black women within the West and the relative scarcity of the Black women within the, um, within the third world, um, we, we allow these power imbalances to persist. Um, and we also eclipse what might very well be the backbone of a movement. Lastly, um, this project asks us to rethink connections within Black women's activism internationally. Reflecting on the title of my presentation, Loose Informal Connections, um, I go back to the definition that uh, Martin and West provided for the Black International. The Black International is made up of local struggles that intersected with one another across diverse boundaries to form loosely and informally a Black International that was greater than its sum of its total constituent parts. It is my hope in this project um, that researchers of Black women's studies will begin to follow through on the efforts to reclaim the stories of invisible women. I hope this project can serve as a start for the archiving of history of Black women's international activism, such as um, Rema Shimola, um, and to draw attention to the ways that uh, women like Rema Shimola are representative um, of women of the third world who make up the multitude of liberation movements. And that is all. Thank you. Let's see. Isaiah Mann says, awesome presentation, Destiny. If anyone has some questions, we have time for one or two for Destiny. Um, you're welcome to use the Q&A button at the bottom if you have any questions. Christina Bush says, thank you, Destiny. What a great project. Hi, Christina. I love how you expose the privileges and politics of the archive. Thank you. <laughs> and adds, curious if you've read slash watched The Watermelon Woman. I haven't. I've heard of it. Um, I will read it after or watch it after your comment. Thank you. And thank you to Isaiah as well. <laughs> <laughs> 